Okay, so <clears throat> this talk, topic modeling on Twitter data comparison, it's, it's, a, it's a slight comparison uh, because I apply two different topic modeling approaches and sort of briefly discuss one or two interesting things that I found. Um, so the talk itself is, is, is divided into three major parts. Um, the first part is actually getting a hold of the Twitter data and how I did that. Um, so I very briefly discuss the key aspects of the Twitter uh, API that I used. And then I show you the scraper that I used at the time as well. <clears throat> Um, then I get into a bit of exploratory data analysis. So, um, you know, because I've just been scraping this data, I had to apply myself a little bit to thinking about how is I going to structure the data for the purposes of you know, an exercise of this nature, and how is I going to approach things. Um, and then finally, I do a bit of topic modeling. So um, I looked at uh, latent digital allocation, which is a popular topic modeling approach, a somewhat traditional one. And then I looked at some embedding-based uh, approaches as well. So that's a rough. That's a rough. Outcome. What's going to happen? So pulling the Twitter data. Um, so a while ago, about I forget when, I think it was like late 2019, um, uh, I created a, a series of uh, lists on Twitter um, <clears throat> to essentially follow people that I didn't want to follow. Um, I think things have changed. And this is the new description that Twitter gives to their list. They say a Twitter list allows you to customize, organize, and prioritize um, the tweets you see in your timeline. Um, I actually used it to follow people that I, I didn't want to follow. So the great thing about a list is you can add a variety of members to the list, you know, five or six people, maybe deplorable people, and that list essentially follows them. And then you can sort of open up that list and you can see kind of uh, what uh, what they're talking about, but they won't necessarily appear on your main, on your main, um, uh, what do you call this thing? They won't appear on your main, <clears throat> on your main wall. Um, <laughs> sorry? Your main feed. Yes, your main, your main feed, your your, your timeline. So That's you can see here on the, on the left, these are my um, these are my lists of which I've got many now. And on the right, that's kind of how they appear. So you'll see now, actually, when you have a list, um, people now appear on that list, which you know means things become a bit counterproductive. But I just wanted to give you a very broad sense of, of what this actually looks like on on Twitter itself. Um, so so I had these lists, and I wanted to essentially create a curated list of uh, people to follow. Um, and I wanted to be able to then pull tweets from that list. <clears throat> so if I wanted to have a bunch of news or market publications or something like this, I could just use the list. And I prefer this approach um, to using the Twitter API in other ways, like conducting search or whatever, because you're not always sure what you're going to get. You know, I wanted to get information um, from specific people. Can you, getting a question from Drew, can you filter on topics? Is that the same as a list? Um, not really. Depends on what you mean by that. But um, a list, a list has individuals. It has handles that you're following, and so then you 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 get everything that that handle essentially tweets. Every status from that handle. You don't necessarily get just the statuses um, that are about certain things. You know, for you to get that, you'd have to use the the search API. Um, and the reason I didn't want to use the search API is because um, the challenge of the search API is you never really know what you're going to get um, because it, it gives you sort of a small window. Um, of content and you can page through it. But if you want to know what Jacob Zuma is saying, for instance, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get that. A topic could be like Cape Town fires. Yeah, so you could search a term like Cape Town fires using the search API. You could also search for hashtags as well. I think there's one called CT fire and there's one called Cape Town fires hashtag. You can get those as well. Um, <clears throat> and I think if you want, if you're using the search API, you can also search by geographic region, right? So you can just pull everything that's happening in Cape Town and everything that's happening in South Africa. But the point is, there's a lot of stuff happening. So then how do you how do you get down to the bottom of what you really want? Um, you need to sort of use some very sophisticated keywords and then a bunch of things. Um, but I, I had experimented with this, and I just uh, found it to be a bit uh, unsatisfactory. But also, in particular, I wanted to collect everything that MoneyWeb was saying, everything that uh, Business Day Live was saying, for instance. And I think using a, using a list is, is, is better, because otherwise, you have to page through all of the different accounts. The other advantage of a list is that you can create your list, you know, in your account to as to the level of depth that you want. So if you're just putting people from the from the list, you can add and remove, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so I found that to be convenient. Um, and so here, the here at the bottom right are the Twitter endpoints that I was interested in using for these purposes. So the first one is the list endpoint, um, <clears throat> which allows you to basically make 15 requests per window per app. And a window here is a 15-minute uh, time window. So these are the rate limits of the, of the, of the API. 
um, the members. So the members allows you to pull all the people that are followed in the list. Bear in mind that the interesting thing about a Twitter list is that you can also follow the list. So um, the members are the people who the list follows, but a subscriber is the person who follows the list, if that makes sense. So when you create a list, you sort of become a subscriber of the list in, in modern times. Um, but anybody can follow your list. So I, I've recently created a list um, which has you know, 4,000 followers, which is strange because I only have less than 200. Um, and then list statuses is the endpoint that allows you to actually pull the statuses of the tweets themselves. That's quite generous. You can do about 900 of those requests uh, every 15 minutes. I think each request pulls about 20 tweets. Um, so, so, so you can get away with, with a lot, with an incredible amount of, um, you know, just using the official API. And the final one I show their status is user timeline. Um, essentially, if there's a specific user interested in following or collecting their tweets, you can do about 1,500 requests against that person's uh, handle per, per, per 15 minute window, which is incredible. And that's free. That's on, that's on the free tier of the API. They've also got a premium tier and a, an enterprise tier if, if, if you're doing something a little bit more exotic. Um, so in particular, I used um, Tweepy, which is essentially just a wrapper, the Twitter API and Python, and it allows you to sort of um, get away with a few things. <clears throat> so the background here is the is actually the code that I wrote uh, over a year ago uh, to 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 sort of go about uh, putting these tweets down. Um, so in the top parts, uh, you know, I just I do a bunch of authentication things, um, set date and time, uh, create a holder for the various tweets that I want. And then here, um, I sort of sleep for about a second while I do a variety of things. The first one is uh, pull down um, the timeline. And the second one is actually uh, pull the extended uh, tweet. And then finally, pull the JSON of that tweet. Um, when I went back recently uh, to look at this, I realized that I made two, two critical errors. One is I hard coded which list I wanted. Um, and the problem is Twitter is very inconsistent about which list it actually gives you, or at least the way it, it, it orders them. Um, so, this, that didn't work out very well, and you'll, you'll see why that doesn't work out in a sec. The other thing is when you actually pull, this actually says timelines, you can't see it, it says timelines. When you pull those timelines, it's actually a request. It actually gives you uh, 20 statuses, um, which means that this bit here was unnecessary. Uh, I only realized that recently. Uh, but nevertheless, I've since updated this code. So, I've, I've, since, I've since extended this uh, to pull all the, all, the, all the lists, all the tweets from all the lists. Um, but at the time, <clears throat> I had this running on a, on a VM, and I still do. Uh, I think it runs every about two hours, if I'm not mistaken. Um, it runs all of this, pulls all the tweets, uh, saves them in a, in a JSON list, um, and Bob and Bob is pretty much your uncle. Um, so I've got, I don't know how many, I assume at this point, uh, thousands of, of, of these JSON files somewhere in a VM. I pulled them down, I consolidated them, consolidated them into um, one massive uh, JSON object, um, and then started sort of slowly interrogating what's going on in there. Yeah, so let me maybe just take you into what some of that exploration looked like. So the first thing I realized um, about this data set is when you pull a tweet, you don't just get the text, you know, this is what someone said, and you don't just get the text plus the screen name. You, you actually get a lot of things, right? Um, so you get entities, which are the hashtags, um, and who's been named in the tweet and a variety of other things. You get the user object, which uh, gives you the screen name, the ID, which is more consistent than the screen name because people change screen names, and a variety of other details about the user as well. You get location information, a uh, city name, and a bunch of other things. Sometimes you get a polygon for where they are, and a variety of other things, including, of course, the date and time of when the tweet was, was sent, et cetera. So one of the first things I had to do was essentially break some of this data away. Um, because ultimately you want to create some sort of nicely structured tabular data set. Um, so I broke some of that away. I brought some of the user ID information back. So I had the user's wow. ID and the screen name, but threw away most of the rest of it. Um, and then I, I brought back some of the location information as well. And then I ended up with this nice little you know, tabular, tabular data set. And I use a nice Python package called SweetViz um, to perform a bit of uh, exploratory data analysis. I'll just pull that into fantastic. So, 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 uh, SweetViz is quite nice. I mean, it shows you every single column in your data, um, and depending on the data type, it gives you some sort of nice uh, univariate analysis, and also might do some correlation or categorical association uh, type of analysis. So, so a lot of what is here is maybe not too important, but <clears throat> there are a handful of things that I want to do, sort of get a sense of. So, first and foremost, how much data do you have? Sort of useful and good to know. Um, but I was also quite interested just to see, uh, you know, what's the language distribution. 
So especially for South African data, uh, of which a lot of this is, um, it's nice to see the language distribution because oftentimes it will say English, even though it's, it's not because there's a lot of mixed language. But typically you'll find undefined, which is UND, or you'll find Tagalog, um, which is actually, I think, um, a Malaysian or Singaporean language, um, which, which people in South Africa don't actually speak. And so that's an indication that the, the language API is off and that you're probably looking at uh, some other languages or some sort of mixed, mixed language. So, so I tend to look at that. Um, I also wanted to look at this in particular because I'm interested in the text components of the data. So about, you have about 600,000 um, rows of data. You generally have about 263,000 uh, unique tweets, right? And that's because of what you see on the right here. So you see a lot of people have the same tweets, you know, RT, Joe Biden, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's because people can retweet a tweet. And if you retweet someone's tweet, uh, you're, you're producing the same content, even though the data row is different. So the screen name is different, the date and time at which the tweet is produced is different, but the, but, the, but the language content is the same. Um, so I was just keen to look at this and see what was happening. So a lot of this tended to be these, um, <clears throat> American guys. Something I wasn't expecting, and I've only just realized now, it's actually part of the Twitter data, is that they tell you what the source of the tweet is. And in particular, you can see that people that use iPhones were you know, the bulk of the tweeters, followed by Android and a variety of other sources. So I just found this to be actually just a strange um, little data set that I hadn't um, anticipated. But it was, it was interesting to see that. Um, I mean, the exact date and time, I think, is worth ignoring. But I did think it was interesting also to look at um, who's being replied to in a, in, a, in a text data set. And this is interesting because the people that are being replied to are the ones generating the most engagement, right? You can see the top the top guy, I mean, tweeted almost 5,000 times. Um, so whoever that person is, um, you know, he clearly generates a lot of really interesting, um, engaging content. Um, I was also interested in the location data, which is why I added it back in. And I was hoping that a great deal of this data would provide like rich you know, location information uh, but unfortunately, it really didn't. You know, uh, well over 99% of the of the tweets didn't have location information, um, and the ones that did um, were mostly for South Africa. And, you know, and you can see, you know, PE's leading, followed by Stellenbosch. Um, but I doubt, I doubt those, um, I doubt that data is is, is accurate or representative. Um, it seems to say that the bulk of the people are from South Africa, which is fine, and it's probably true. Um, but given how you know, small populated it is. It's probably not of worth of value. <clears throat> the other thing I was quite interested in is seeing who's actually doing the bulk of the tweeting. And here you can see it's a lot of the a lot of the publications, uh, BD Live SA, Fortune Magazine, um, so on and so forth. They did you know the majority of the stuff, um, and then of course you know the the, the various accounts drop uh, quite a bit. And obviously, I also wanted to look at uh, how much data I was actually collecting on a weekly basis, um, and that was about you know, 7,000-ish tweets. So this gave me like a broad sense of what was happening in the data. Because you can see who's replying to who, you can build um, a graph and sort of look at you know, relationships. Um, there's, there's a decent amount of text data, unique text data, 263,000 uh, 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 documents, as it were. So, so there's some interesting, nice um, NLP stuff you can do in a variety of things. Um, so that was that was quite encouraging, um, but as you can imagine, this has been an iterative uh, process. I've gone sort of backwards and forwards quite a few times, um, and one of the things that I did somewhere in the middle of the process is I said, well, the way I pulled the data down the first time didn't give me access to the list that I was pulling, um, and given uh, you know who's tweeting and the, the factors I've looked at, I wanted to attach back the list that I was looking at. And ultimately, when I did that, I realized that uh, looking at the ML tweets was probably a good idea. And I'll, I'll give you a sense of that in a sec about the distribution. So um, I looked over time, all the way from May 2019 until March 2021. Um, <clears throat> and I looked at which tweets belong to which list. And so this is this hard coding problem that I was referring to. So you can see early on, up until pretty much January 2020, uh, it was mostly market uh, and news data. And then for most of 2020, it was fees data, which is a bunch of uh, these was four type activists. And then as of 2021, it was network science for a little while, and then, and then closely followed by machine learning, NLP, and NLP, and NLP. Um, so, so originally, I'd taken this full data set, you know, applied uh, some LDA to it, applied uh, some BERT topic to it, and the BERT topic sort of fell apart. Once you get above 30,000 or so documents, it really starts to struggle. The LDA takes a while, but again, because you've got like this large mix of 
you know, fairly different things and it starts to fall apart. So uh, focusing a little bit more specifically on a, on a domain seemed like a really good idea. Um, <clears throat> and because I hadn't actually looked at these lists, I'd followed them, but I hadn't really bothered to investigate. I thought the ML ones would be kind of interesting and I thought they'd probably be um, very familiar to the audience. So, 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 so that's, that's something I wanted to kind of focus on. I thought there was a, a nice amount of data, but not, not too anything too crazy. And it was also quite recent. Um, so, so I did the LDA that gave me a sense of what was happening in the data. And, um, you know, I also sort of selected an interesting piece of the data. But um, one of the things that was interesting is how do you select uh, the problem to sort of pursue, right? Because the data has lots of implied problems built into it. Topic modeling is kind of a nice, obvious, easy one, but some of the suggestions I've got when, when asking a few colleagues and friends um, was around creating data sets, right? Creating a, a large open data set um, that you can enrich with information from Wikipedia and other sources to make it you know, interesting and useful for people to use um, for secondary and tertiary tasks. Uh, creating a nice essay colloquialism data set. So especially the feed there that I collected throughout 2020, lots of really good mixed language in there, um, lots of colloquialism, lots of, you know, um, language you otherwise wouldn't get from some international academic data set that could be useful. And then, of course, comparing the RAND value to you know, Twitter sentiment. So um, the sort of the, 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 the markets data from 2019, you know, you've got several months of data, you can compare that. Of course, that's no longer very um, <clears throat> timely, but that's a type of analysis you can do. And then, of course, community de detection, um, which is looking at who's talking to who and, and breaking that apart and trying to understand what the groups, what was happening in those groups. Um, I ultimately went for topic modeling because um, I think one of the first things you want to do when you're exploring a data set is just know what the data is about. Um, and knowing that uh, the domain is news, or the domain is markets, or the domain is NLP, doesn't necessarily tell you what is happening inside the data. But topic modeling uh, promises that. So it seemed like a good place to go, um, and it seemed like a nice you know, a time to stick one's teeth back into this idea. So ultimately, you want to know what uh, topics are being discussed and you know how how they're distributed at the very highest level. But um, I would say that this this hides a lot of complexity, and I'll show I'll show some of this um, when we get around to the results. So we've selected topic modeling uh, as an area of interest. Um, so the obvious question is, is is what is what is topic modeling? So topic modeling is uh, an unsupervised machine learning technique that's capable of scanning a set of documents detecting words and phrase patterns within them and automatically clustering word groups and similar expressions that best characterize a set of documents. This is from uh, Monkey Learn. So uh, I think this is more of an ambition um, than, a, uh, than a description, right? Um, topic modeling can do a lot for you automatically. The bulk of the work, uh, the analysis still, still, still uh, resides with the analyst. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of that in a sec as well. So there's two topic modeling approaches that I went for. One was latent digital education, which I'll discuss now. And the next one is, 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 uh, is a bird topic or, a, or a <clears throat> an embedding-based um, topic modeling approach. Um, so latent digital education was devised by uh, three, three, three gentlemen, David Blair, Andrew Ng, and uh, Michael, Michael Jordan. Um, not, not this Michael Jordan, of course, but the, you know, the, the academic. Um, <clears throat> and the idea, the idea of topic modeling is that um, it essentially assumes that you've got a document um, and that document is a bag of words. <clears throat> and what you do when you create the document is you decide that this document will contain words that will be pulled from some distribution of topics. And in this case, let's say there's, there's two topics in particular, uh, fruits and drinks. And then you essentially pull words out of fruits and drinks and you drop them into documents. And then kind of assume away the complexity of all the syntax that arrives at a, at a meaningful sentence. So this is, you know, roughly, roughly what we're estimating. And what we assume in LDA is that um, that number of topics is, is known up front. So you tell it about four topics and will, you know, automatically uh, identify how it is that those four topics came to form all of these different documents. Um, and then depending on the level of sophistication, you can then look at the doc at the topics within the document and you can say, 20% uh, of this document is this topic and that topic and this other topic. And you can then, um, you know, take the one that's, that's the maximum and you can assign your document uh, to that topic. Um, so actually implementing LDAs is fairly straightforward. Uh, there's a package in GenSum called LDA, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
there's there are a number of traditional because it's a traditional method the number of traditional that you want to take so you want to eliminate some stop words in this case i removed uh, rt and https and http which are traditional sort of uh, twitter stop words um, i use a trigram language model so i used groups of uh, words from one to two to two to three and then i removed any word that appeared less than three times uh, this was a fairly fairly sort of standard implementation um, i used default parameters of the model uh, and then i arbitrarily selected uh, 10 10 topics and then assigned um, one topic to every single document um, so selecting 10 topics in the LDA context tends to be a very controversial uh, choice. And um, it's something which uh, I think topic modeling practitioners try to spend a lot of time trying to resolve. And there's two ways to try and resolve this, right? What is, how do you establish the right number of topics? Um, the traditional method is to apply a method called uh, perplexity or to extract a perplexity measure, which looks at the, <clears throat> I think it's the normalized lot likelihood of your uh, of your LDA model on unseen data, um, and while that's sort of a rational uh, thing to do, the challenge is it typically doesn't correlate with what people would consider to be coherent topics. As a matter of fact, people say that it's actually slightly negatively correlated. Um, and so there's this uh, coherence framework which looks at a variety of um, measures that try to look at the top coefficients um, for your topic modeling approach and then see if those are consistent with each other or if they're you know, rational in some way. Um, and this is sort of like the preferred approach. Um, yeah, so, uh, you know, I sort of shy away from sort of any approach that tries to give you the right number of topics, um, because I think that in establishing the right number of topics, there's probably a lot of domain knowledge that goes into it. Um, and so, <clears throat> you know, if LDA says that there's four topics and there should be 12, um, you know, you, you still have to do some, some, some work to establish uh, where those 12 topics are, regardless of what your complexity or coherence measures may say. Um, so, so my bias in this case is to pick some arbitrary reasonable number of topics, uh, investigate them, um, and then sort of maybe sort of do some of this um, uh, additional uh, uh, parameterization. Um, so so, so the, uh, the embedding-based topic modeling approaches. Now, part of the reason why, why I was interested in doing topic modeling is precisely because this idea cropped up um, uh, sort of recently, I think like a year-ish or so ago, somebody sort of somebody brought this uh, to my attention. They said, "Well, you know, typically with um, all these different um, topic modeling approaches, it, you know, you, you sort of have to um, create some sort of complex, uh, you know, algorithm to you know represent your your data in a in a, in a, in a TF in a, in a term frequency matrix, and then you apply some 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 sophisticated and then you algebra and get an answer." Um, <clears throat> but there was, I think it was in 2010, Thomas Mikhailov uh, sort of assured the world that you can actually embed words in high dimensional space, right? And you can perform um, linear algebra on those words, right? So you can add, um, you know, um, you can take a word like king, you can subtract man from it, you can add woman to it, and then you get, you know, a vector that looks like queen, for instance. And that, this was like an interesting idea. Um, and I remember at the time, uh, you know, we were exploring exactly this kind of idea. We were saying, we pull Twitter data and we, you know, do some stuff to it. Can we extract like meaningful, interesting things? Um, and one of the things we wanted to do as part of our keyword search was eliminate keyword search altogether and use semantic search, you know, uh, embedding-based search. And part of the problem with doing that with word vectors is that <clears throat> when you take a bunch of, when you take a tweet, you take any document, and you have a series of word vectors, when you arbitrarily combine those word vectors or you average them or anything like this uh, you typically lose a lot of meaning right and it usually averages out something not useful um, and so this new idea has recently emerged where you can actually embed sentences so i think um, one of the one of the salient ideas here was around uh, universal sentence encoding right so you're no longer dealing with something where you take a known word and you embed that known word like you know king or queen or whatever you can take an arbitrary sentence and embed that sentence in high dimensional space. And then you get all the benefits of high dimensional space. The key of the main which the main one is is being able to apply uh, linear algebra to that sentence. So um, so your embedding based topic modeling approach directly benefits from this. So you're able to take all your documents, in this case, all of our tweets. We're able to embed them in high dimensional space. And once they're there, we're able to apply really any kind of clustering technique we care for, whether it's k-means or anything else. And what that should naturally do is bring together documents that relate to or about um, 
the same thing. Um, the challenge, of course, is that when you have a high dimensional space, 100 dimensions, 300 dimensions, you know, what have you, um, your clustering, your clustering methods might struggle. And so one of the things you might want to do is apply some sort of dimensionality reduction, you know, bring down the dimensions, um, and then and then and then sort of go from there. <clears throat> and then now you have topics. Um, and there might obviously be a natural question around how do you then um, extract coefficients? Because typically you need some sort of coefficients to tell you uh, what are the most impactful, important um, words that define a cluster. Um, but before I answer that, I just want to introduce you know, BERT topics. So BERT topic is a way of doing this. Uh, BERT is a, if I remember correctly, a bidirectional um, the question. It's a bidirectional um, transformer uh, approach to building large scale language models. I think it was released by the guys at Google. Um, I think just before, just before New York 2019. So um, I think, you know, I don't know, sometime in 2019 if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so what's particularly interesting about these language models is that they built them on massive, massive, massive amounts of data. Um, and they built them on a, on a handful of tasks. I forget the specific one that Bert was trained on, but I think the two main ways that people build language models is either to uh, build mass language models where you sort of hide some of the words and then you have to, the model has to predict uh, which word is which, or um, you sort of predict just the next word and then it, it sort of learns uh, all kinds of interesting things about it, about the language, sorry, that is. Um, what's great about these models is that they were built as uh, high level models that could then be adapted to low level tasks. And so the nice thing is that some good people have done this for us. They've taken these models and they've adapted them to the purpose of just being able to take a sentence and embed it in high dimensional space. Um, <clears throat> the other great thing is that because BERT has a lot of different uh, implementations and ideas, um, there are a lot of uh, versions of BERT that have been trained for uh, a variety of different languages, especially low resource languages um, like our South African languages, like Isuzulu, a variety of others. So in this, the model that we use in particular here um, has English and Afrikaans and is um, built into the built into the language model. So um, in, a, in a previous iteration when I was clustering uh, the entire data set, um, it was actually able to extract one or two um, uh, clusters or one or two topics that were specifically focused around um, uh, people speaking in Isitasa. So that's so that, that sort of bodes well for, for future applications. Um, so, so I use this model uh, to embed to embed uh, these ML tweets in high dimensional space, or at least the topic did this for me. And then first of all, we'll started out by implementing um, a nice dimensionality reduction method called UMAP, um, which is able to take this high dimensional uh, sentence vector and bring it down to about, if I remember correctly, five dimensions. Um, the advantage, and I think some of you may know about uh, T's knee, um, I think it's a T distributed neighbor, uh, nearest neighbor embedding, which was a very popular method for, uh, you know, creating um, beautiful um, uh, sort of 2D representations of high dimensional uh, data. And I think people applied it oftentimes to word embeddings. Um, but the challenge is that it, it, it loses global uh, context. It may retain local context, but it loses global context. Whereas UMAP is able to maintain global context even while you're reducing dimensions. I don't think that matters too much in our case because we're actually interested in the local structure, which is where the topic should exist. But nevertheless, it is it is the new kid on the block. And DB scan, I think, is quite an old um, uh, clustering method um, that essentially allows you to cluster uh, uh, data without having to provide uh, uh, you know the number of clusters that you want. You can simply provide a sense of uh, how close um, uh, elements need to be or how close observations need to be. Uh, and how, how how many observations would uh, determine a, uh, a region of interest or a, a density. Uh, and then on that basis, it's able to automatically detect outlines of a variety of things, create clusters for you, and then say, you know, you've got 20 clusters, uh, which which has which has its pros and cons. Uh, yes, so now uh, for the interesting bit. Um, so I'm just going to show you, um, you know, sort of what, what has come out, uh, just the distribution of the topics. Um, some words and coefficients, uh, in particular for, 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 for two topics that I find quite interesting, and the top tweets, um, and hopefully soon after that we'll, uh, we'll wrap up. Um, <clears throat> so the first thing I really wanted to show you is that um, you know, we've got bird topic on the right and LDA on the on, 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 sorry, bird topic on the left and LDA on the right. You'll notice that with bird topic, there's a, there's a very big negative one class. There's actually 11 classes on, on, on the bird topic side. And negative one is, is what I'd refer to as the junk class. I think this is a direct consequence of the way that DB scan works. Um, I think a lot of tuning is probably required there um, to be able to get that down so that you, you sort of are able to um, 
get a few more uh, salient clusters. Um, it introduces some level of complexity in, in, in every variation of bird topic that I ran. Um, about 50% of the data would end up in the junk topic, which, which, I, which I would argue is probably too much, um, given how concentrated at this point uh, the ML tweets data is. If it is the broad data set, it would make more sense. But given that it's just the ML uh, data set, I, I would imagine that that, that minus one is, is, is well overblown. And on the right hand side, you can see we've got a much more uniform um, um, sort of distribution of topics. Um, similarly, I, I think that's probably um, that's probably a little bit uh, unnatural as well. I wouldn't expect them to have that like nice little beautiful shape. But again, it's because we haven't we haven't really focused too much on optimizing these things. We've rather focused on extracting them, looking at them, and then using that as a as an iteration process. Um, and if you're a bit alarmed by the sort of large numbers um, representing the topics on the bird topic side, it's because bird topic actually naturally generates quite a large number of topics. And the way you bring it to 10 is it periodically uh, sort of joins them back up again into, into these <coughs> uh, just 10 topics. Uh, we can take those by arbitrarily selected um, number of topics. So there's, there's two topics that I found uh, particularly interesting in each, in each um, topic modeling approach. Um, on the bird topic side, I found 221, um, this topic here, to be of interest. Um, and on the LDA side, I found topic three to be a bit interesting. And so I'll, I'll take you into each of them and we can sort of discuss uh, what's going on there. So with bird topic, on the right, what you'll see is, is, the, is actually the same um, word cloud. So I just took uh, essentially all the documents from that topic and I produced a word cloud. And the one on the bottom shows the more right-hand side of the word cloud and one on the top shows the more left-hand side of the word cloud. Um, please don't judge me for this choice. Um, it just looked like a nice little... Uh, PowerPoint template, and I decided to um, embrace it fully. And on the, on the left, you'll see a table which shows the coefficients uh, that represent the specific topic. Um, and so when I looked at this, and this is you know using the ML tweets uh, data set from, 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 from March, when I looked at it, it just seemed a bit interesting because um, there's a lot of talk about happiness and uh, you know comic books and like you know pineapple cake um, and eating pineapples. And I just thought, like, what on earth is going on here? Um, you know, when I look when I look at the coefficients, pineapple is is the most um, is the strongest uh, term, and then there's you know discussion about Jan Le Pen. So I don't know, maybe Jan Le Pen has a new sort of pineapple recipe that he's cooking up. Maybe this is a, a new sort of like language model or some work that's happening at, at Facebook or something. I don't know, but uh, it just seemed uh, strange, <clears throat> and I wanted to investigate it a little bit more deeply. Um, and when I actually went looking for the actual tweets that represented or came out of this, uh, one of the things you can actually just do is you can just take the coefficients and you can just apply them to all the tweets and you can rank the tweets. And the top tweets that came out were these ones, right? And, and if you look at this top tweet here on the right, it says, um, I think my happiness is reading comics, um, uh, drinking good tea and having pineapple cakes, right? And that, that was actually um, tweeted by Cla uh, Taryn uh, Klanewatt, who is this person here, TK. Uh, Sasagi, she's actually um, a computer vision NLP practitioner that focuses a lot on, um, I think, sort of computer vision around Japanese characters. Um, what was weird and interesting about this is that, you know, um, she's obviously a, a relevant member of the machine learning community, but <clears throat> this particular topic arose because she submitted, uh, you know, a paper or some work or something, and between about the 5th and the 15th of March, she just, you know, kept talking a lot about pineapple cake. And actually generated a bit of engagement, right? So a bunch of people started talking about pineapple cake and so on and so forth. So this was actually a full-on topic, specifically around pineapple cakes that had arisen within the ML community. Um, and what's interesting about this is that even though it's unexpected, because you wouldn't expect pineapple cakes to be a typical topic of discussion in the ML community, um, it's still nevertheless relevant, right? If your question was, what were the things that people were discussing? What are the ten things people were discussing? We'd probably highlight this as something that people were discussing. You just probably wouldn't um, attach much um, academic or technical value to the discussion. And the other tweets, you know, speak to uh, the talk that Jan Lequin is doing as part of Quantas uh, AI. And someone congratulated him for, and then you know, a lot of engagement was, was created around that. Another topic around the David Sontag's um, ML and healthcare course, which I actually had a look, brief look at, and actually looks incredibly compelling. And quite a few people are interested in that. What you'll notice is that these, these, these three things probably don't relate to each other as much as they should. Um, and, so, and so that probably speaks to, you know, um, joining these topics up in a, in a variety of ways, something like that. But I'd also say that um, 
what's maybe hidden or apparent is that uh, very likely the great majority of people in this topic are speaking towards um, what Taryn is talking about, not, not, not these other topics. Um, so what this demonstrates to me um, is, is one of the really powerful aspects of topic modeling, which is that uh, even though it's even though you're topic modeling in a domain that you know and understand, there's always opportunity to discover things uh, that are serendipitous, right? And this is one. This is one such. This is one such topic. Um, <clears throat> the other topic I found interesting was topic three in, in LDA. So when you look at this topic, when you look at the word clouds on the right, you see sweet spot and you see language modeling, uh, natural language, uh, coming up quite a bit, um, et cetera, et cetera. I think literature also comes up. And when you look at the coefficients of the words, you see model and you see language. And so naturally you think, well, this has a lot to do with language modeling, uh, which would be like a nice obvious conclusion. So if you didn't sort of look any more into it, you'd say, well, this is a topic broadly around language modeling and somebody thinks language modeling is a sweet spot or something like this. Um, when you actually look at the top tweets within this, within this uh, topic, you realize that Miles Brundage actually started an entire thread where he was talking about topic modeling. Uh, sorry, where he was talking about uh, language modeling. And one of the things that he uh, touched on sort of um, briefly is that, uh, in fact, his thread was about um, AI ethics and AI policy. And one of the things that he was trying to say, if I paraphrase him correctly, is that one of the challenges um, in, in, in AI policy and AI ethics is that um, there, there are a number of um, big companies who, like Google, et cetera, who directly benefit from um, the direction that research goes in um, and who probably don't want um, too much for some of those sort of negative consequences of the work that they do to be highlighted, right? And so, I mean, he had an incredibly long thread, I think easily 20-ish uh, tweets and generated a bit of engagement. Um, the point being that this topic is about language modeling, but it's actually a lot more about AI policy and AI ethics than it is about language modeling per se. Language modeling is just you know, the region which, within which AI ethics and AI politics, um, AI policies happens. Um, and so, and so, really, this topic um, speaks to um, a different dynamic in topic modeling, which is that just because the coefficients and the resulting word cloud look a particular way, so to speak, doesn't mean that you've actually identified what the topic is. Right? The way you identify what a topic is is to have sort of a depth of understanding of the domain and to investigate some of the actual underlying documents. And that gives you um, a much, much clearer sense of, of, of what you're doing. So in other words, the analysis work still has to happen. And, and something I notice a lot in, um, in, 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 the, in the sort of um, articles from Toward Data Science that I, that I you know, uh, used to get here is that oftentimes people find it sufficient to say, here are the coefficients, here's like a, a very consistent looking word cloud, let this all go home. And as a matter of fact, the coherence measure for LDA um, kind of says a similar kind of thing. Well, you know, the top sort of uh, terms look pretty similar. Let's, let's all go home. However, in order to make the topic actionable, in order to actually use it, you actually need to have a real sense of what's happening in that topic. And so the purpose of topic modeling is not to generate these coefficients and to um, generate these word clouds, but rather to generate the, the story, the explanation um, of what is it exactly within meaningful context that's happening within this topic, within this broader domain. Um, and so I just want to leave you <clears throat> with this with this thought that I've been reflecting on slightly. Um, so, so I mean, we, we've, we've gone through, um, you know, collecting the data set with, with, with TweetP, uh, structuring uh, the data set for a particular problem, you know, selecting the ML tweets, uh, performing LDA using these two methods and, and highlighting, you know, uh, serendipity and how um, words and coefficients can be can be misleading with these two topics. Um, but the picture that you see here in the background is that is actually a picture from some analysis that a collaborator of mine did, a uh, Carl Finley. Um, <clears throat> he focuses a lot on um, uh, community detection on Twitter, um, and he focuses a lot in the domain of South African politics, not just global politics. And what what he likes to do is to try and understand how many people are discussing, um, are talking to each other rather. And he defines you know, who these people are based on who the, 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 top, um, the top contributors are. But the story that's told ultimately doesn't really come from knowing that um, you know, this is Dito Mboweni and some of his guys and knowing that this is Ramaphosa, et cetera. The story actually comes from all the political news that happens leading up to the point of analysis. Um, in other words, depth of understanding 
of the of the domain. That's where the real value comes from. The analysis, the topic modeling, the, the clustering which he does here, the community detection, um, allows you to put that domain knowledge into uh, additional context. It allows you to quantify, it allows you to identify uh, where, where and when some of these things were happening naturally in, in a place like Twitter. Bear in mind that he doesn't actually read um, you know, thousands of tweets, sometimes millions of tweets that he uses to produce uh, this analysis. But because of all the political coverage that's happening, it's pretty clear um, based on you know, looking at who's talking and when, um, what, what the underlying discussion is. So the thought, the thought I wanted to give you is um, um, at this point, you know, what I've established is I've, I've done some top modeling, I've established that there's some interesting uh, trends. And what I need to sort of go on and do now is, is dig a lot deeper into um, what was actually happening in the ML community on Twitter um, throughout, you know, sort of the first, the first half of March. And on that basis, what I'll be able to do then is take this information and contextualize it and ultimately tell a story. Um, so yeah, so if you're interested in that, uh, please let me know and then we can set up uh, part two at CTML, hopefully not <laughs> this month, uh, probably next month. Um, and we can come back and I can dive dive a little bit deeper um, to the to the conversation. That's that's where I'd like to leave it. Uh, very uh, questions and thoughts. Um, very happy to see them.